Welcome to Nailing the Apex. Today on the show from Arrow McLaren IndyCar team, it's team principal Gavin Ward. Uh, Gavin, thanks very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, we're doing great. Thanks, Tim. Happy to be here. Uh, so I, I think we had discussed before I hit record, but I'm allowed to announce this, hopefully. And, and if I get in trouble, we'll just cut it out before this thing airs. But I'm happy <laughs> to announce that uh, you yourself are going to have uh, your own periodic segment on Nailing the Apex throughout the uh, 2024 IndyCar season. First of all, I just want to thank you um, and the team, also, obviously, for doing this. It's also, you know, you're, you're going to be able to provide... I think just so much in-depth details that, you know, our fans have, have really been asking for. So, you know, man, thanks very much for, for doing that. I know you're really busy. Yeah, but no, it's important. Obviously we get to do this because of the, the people who are passionate you know, and follow the sport. And I, I love being able to kind of give a little more insight where we can. Um, I think IndyCar is, is a, is an awesome sport and I've been lucky to work in motor racing my whole life. And, you know, we're fellow Canadians here, so it's, uh, it's fun to kind of support that fan base and yeah, I'm good. No, it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, uh, uh, you know, to get in depth and to, I guess, nerd out a bit for me is, is, is fantastic because I love that side of the sport, obviously. Um, I guess to jump right into things, you know, you're just coming off of the 2023 season uh big things for you right like running that entire operation becoming team principal there uh you know just when you i guess when you reflect on last season gavin you know do what are some of the things that you learned oh man i mean we uh we <laughs> it's a fully loaded question <laughs> yeah it's been a, a heck of a learning curve um you know having really spent my whole life really chasing this the dream of working in racing and, and have, having worked in professional racing for, um, you know, almost 20 years, um, now the, but this is the, f the first role where I've really, um, had this exposure to the, the full, the full scope, you know, I'm an engineer by background and to get, 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 um, that insight into, really all the, the the makings of a race team and what it takes uh, to build a great race team has been super interesting. Definitely learned a heck of a lot. Um, I think we did a pretty decent job last year with growing the team, adding a car, um, putting together, you know, our four car 500 effort um, with Kanan, you know, having TK's last 500 with, a, with the team. And really, you know, a lot of positives, you know, I think it's easy to, to pick away at, oh yeah, you didn't, we didn't win a race, you know, but that's something I preach here all the time. Motor racing can be pretty, pretty cruel sport and you can do everything right. And it can still kick you swift in the, in the groin. But, uh, <laughs> um, so I think you need to have that a, a little bit of a healthy detachment from the results and, you know, focus on really just trying to build a better race team day in, day out. And I think we've done that, you know, we decided to get into this, the second year in the role. Um, the role's kind of grown a little bit again in scope and uh, team principal job title now. And I think that's a good refle reflection of what we're doing here. So, um, but it's, a, this team's just got, I just really appreciate how fantastic this group of people is and, you know, to get to come and work here and try and do something I think is quite special, which is really bring a championship in 500 to McLaren and try and bust up what's been a 20 year dominance of the sport by a couple teams. So uh, it's no small task, but we're, we're up for it. I mean, when you're going up against the likes of, you know, Team Penske, uh, you know, Chip Ganassi Racing, um, obviously Andretti Autosport. I mean, those, I mean, these guys, that I mean, like Gavin, you and I were back in Formula Ford and those teams were just, you know, in Champ Car and in IndyCar just kicking ass, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. And, you know, they've benefited from decades of massive amount of investment, you know, mm -hmm. in their facilities here. They run these multiple series race race teams out of one one roof, um, but you know I I do feel like 
there's a better way to do it. And we're, we're trying to do that here. You know, we're trying to have fun. We're trying to be a, you know, really, a I hope a breath of fresh air to the sport. And I want to, I, I mean, I, I want to change the sport for the better mm-hmm. by winning in the right way. And the right way is like taking care of people being a, a, a progress, like a, a modern take on how to run a race team, you know, embrace uh, individuality, diversity, draw from the best talent pool we can, be creative with how we get our people, develop people from within. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to be smarter than these guys because I think there's a little bit of, look, we got great backing as a team, but those top teams aren't, aren't, aren't struggling either. It's a, it's a proper war. Um, and even, yeah, you talk about the Penske Ganassi, we know they're incredibly well-funded and they're incredibly well-established, uh, teams, but Andretti's not hanging around. They're consolidating to three cars, no more pay drivers, you know, they're going to, they are building a brand new shop. There's huge investment going on there. Um, Ray Hall are in a brand new facility up in Zionsville outside Indianapolis. It's a beautiful building they built there. It's not like these guys aren't trying. No. So, um, it's, it's it's a, it's a battle. Like it's, I was just going to say that Gavin, like, it's just, it's going to be a war, man. Like IndyCar is just like, it's just a war, like just on track, like the, the competition, is just so close. I mean, the drivers are just so skilled. And that's, you know, one of the things that I've seen, I think, over the last decade, and then even coming into the last three years, honestly, is just the the driver be the drivers being weeded out. Like you can like you guys actually like IndyCar has like I would say the top twenty drivers could race in anything around the world and be competitive. Like it's remarkable. It's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. It's mind blowing. Yeah, you know, to come from the F1 world. I know the cars are different and the ability to tune the cars are different, but, you know, where it was fairly commonplace for a teammate to be half a second, six mm-hmm. tenths, eight tenths a second off their teammate. I mean, here, if a guy's two tenths off, it's a problem. Yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a team principal, you know, You've worked under, you know, many in your career, you know, like Christian Horner to, to name one for sure, is a, who's a big name who everyone will know who listens to this show. But, you know, when you look at all the team principals you've worked for and you look at all of the uh, uh, other individuals you've worked underneath, you know, when you approach this team principal job, like how, how are you going to how do you want to do it differently? Yeah, you know, I think um, I've been lucky to work with some some great people in the sport for sure. Um, but I also in that time have kind of rightly or wrongly always felt there was a better way to do it. And now kind of feeling like I've got the opportunity to see if I'm right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so I, you know, I think it comes from being, uh, sort of genuine and true true to your values. So for me, you know, I really genuinely enjoy teaching people, helping people, developing people. And this is a people sport. Like, talk about the battle that's going on. The biggest battle we've got going on is for talent. You know, it's that is where the biggest scrap is in IndyCar. And I think it's probably reflective of other parts of, of the world in general, but... There is, a, for the car counts we've got right now, the health of sports car racing, which draws on the same talent pool um, in North America, there is not enough experienced good people to go around. Mm-hmm. And and it's not economically feasible to go into a bidding war to try and buy them all in. So how do you compete, right? I mean, I think one way is you need to be a better place to work. And, um, look, we've got the advantage that a lot of the people, you know, that work in motor racing, it's been a passion and a dream to, to do so. So it's about kind of keeping that fire alive. Um, but then there's also, 
And one thing I've had to learn, look, I grew up, you know, with my whole career being kind of on the competition, engineering, mechanics side of racing, I probably had a biased view of that in terms of there's also a really important part to our team, which is commercial marketing, human resources, finance, you know, how you run. It's not maybe not the sexy a part of the of the equation, but it's absolutely crucial to what we're trying to do. And some of those people don't necessarily come from, you know, they didn't get in the sport necessarily because they were gung-ho racing fans and they come from a very different background all the time and trying to pull that together and you, they still need to jive. We still mm-hmm. need to make everybody get on. Um, that's been an interesting challenge actually kind of making that. I, that I bet because you're trying to like, I mean, it's kind of similar. I think in, you know, when I, you know, left racing, even though I didn't want to, but left racing to do, you know, the media thing, it's kind of like you, you run into a lot of folks who just don't under, didn't really understand motorsports or why, you know, I was so passionate about it. And, and then you kind of got to try and, uh, you know, show them why, tell them why, and just like, look, it's a, such a cool sport at the end of the day. Like when you, when you really see all the stories and, and then you see the things in the behind the scenes of how hard everybody works and what everybody sacrifices to do to, to be in motorsports. I mean, it's, uh, it's really cool. And, and I totally understand what, what you're, what you're saying there. And so that's definitely probably one of the challenges that you must have to, you know, sort of face and, and deal with and, and find creative ways. Yeah. You know, I, we're just really trying, um, to do what's right for IndyCar yeah. you know, to do what's right to build a, a, a kick, kick-ass race team and it's um it's just a constant learning process Mm. you know i think we haven't got it all figured out but i think as a as a team principal what i really prescribe to is kind of first and foremost being quite genuine um and not really trying to be somebody else, but be myself, which I think may, maybe comes across a bit a bit loose and free at times, which is, um, you know, I don't want that to be misconstrued with the fact we're incredibly driven to 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 crush it um, on track, but you know, I really want to do that the right way. I think. Again, like a lot of people won't know, but some people that are passionate from the engineering side of motorsport will be familiar with, there's a university competition out there called Formula SAE that a lot of people, a lot of people who work in racing did when they were at college, university. If you're an engineer, it's a good chance, and you were into racing, it's a good chance you were part of a Formula SAE team. Mm -hmm. And like, this is a competition where schools build and compete with their own race cars. And it's all around the world. It's called from a student in the, in, in, in Europe and Australia. But, um, you know, I think what's interesting is that you'll talk to some people that work in professional motorsports that like made it their career, made like achieve their dream. And they will talk of their days doing SAE, which was free and nowhere near the level in some ways of what pro top level uh motorsport is Mm -hmm. but they'll talk about it as some of the best times of their career and i think i want this race team to feel like an sae team where people are you know at that point you're doing it just for the love of it and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of camaraderie and it's hard work but you just embrace the grind, you know, that's stealing a quote slash title from a, a goalie book that I really like. But anyways, <laughs> you and your goalie <laughs> books, man, <laughs> <laughs> driving styles. What was the, the one thing you always say? Driving styles. It's like, uh, yeah. it's like, uh, the myth is one, there is no one perfect style. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Another thing I stole from say all, all from Justin Goldman's book. Anyway, Justin Goldman is, He's my hero. He's an awesome dude. Uh, if you if you like ice hockey and you like motor racing, or if you just want to learn about the men- mental side of being a goalie, I highly recommend his stuff. It's uh, the power within. I think he could have called it Zen and the Art of Goaltending. Um, but that probably would have copyright infringement for somebody. But anyways. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, and there's a great 
the head of the Swedish um, hockey's goalie coaching program has that saying, there is no one perfect style. And it's true. It's true for, I say this stuff all the time here. You know, I've, I've seen people go wrong working with drivers all the time where they try and make one driver fit Just another driver's yeah. car and style. We got to get the best out of who you got. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, 100%. Um, so you've got a, you've got a livery launch coming up. Um, That's right. So tell us, tell us a little bit about this because, uh, there are some IndyCar teams who, who do livery launches, but there's a lot that don't. And I think like it's, it's smart that, you know, for Aero McLaren in particular to kind of build that up. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going to be, uh, going to be happening here over the next few days? That's right. Yeah. So February 6th, 7th and 8th, uh, we'll be doing an on online uh, launch. Um, so the 6th uh, will be Ro Alexander Rossi's car and David Malukas on the 7th and Pato Award on the on the 8th. And it, yeah, I think it's a fun thing that we get to do here because, you know, unlike a lot of IndyCar teams, we, we really try and run a, a team, team branding. Um, this is an area where we get great collaboration between us and Indy and the, uh, the wonderful people, um, on the marketing team in the UK that work out of MTC and it's a great, they add, they add a lot of value for us and we get some really cool schemes. Um, I think everyone's going to be pretty hyped about this stuff. It's going to look great. I, I just love the way our cars have looked the last few years. The 500 cars. Oh, 500 cars were sick. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, good. like goosebumps, yeah. goosebumps. It's like, and that makes it special. And I, you know, even one of our, uh, one of our mechanics, uh, a guy named Chris Stafford, who I adore and he's, he's joined us. It's funny cause we both have an F1 background. He, he spent about 10 years at Williams, yeah. um, maybe more, uh, but a long time at Williams F1. And now he's, he's working with us. And when we first got Felix's 500 card together last year, he's just like, just said to the guys, like, everybody, let's, let's just take a moment and <laughs> throw the, like, before we put it in the truck, let's throw the body work on it and let's just look at that list because this is a special moment. And it, it is like those, like, it's, let's, I think back to like, you know what it was like when you were a kid. There were race cars that even now oh, yeah. are like give you the goosebumps. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I know that scheme is going to be the next generation. People are going to think about those cars. And that's cool to be a part of. It's fun because it's like that's what got me into this sport. And it's nice to. Oh, dude, the. Uh... <laughs> The uh, the golf uh, the golf livery that um, the McLaren did for the uh, Monaco Grand Prix a few years ago was exactly friggin' Super awesome, cool. man. <laughs> Super <laughs> cool. <laughs> and Williams had another good one as well this past season. But I mean, I can go on and on about liveries. I mean, Alonso's Renault, like the blue and yellow, like that that thing just you know screams. Daryl Franchitti's awesome. yeah. uh, Daryl Franchitti's team cool green car, like that was. One that always stands out to me as well. Um, yeah, I mean the players. Um, oh yeah, the players' cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, that as for us Canadians, that was. Yeah. A, but uh, yeah, you know, it's fun just to be a part of. Um, you want your cars to look look good and be fast. Um, Speaking of fast, let's talk about your drivers real quick here. I mean, because you've got you, you know you've got your three drivers, but coming into this season. Uh, you've got a new one, you know, gone is Felix Rosenquist. He's off to Meyer Shank racing in comes David Malukas. You know, when you were uh, evaluating David, you know, what did you guys, what did you guys see in him? Yeah. You know, we, we definitely obviously had a little bit of a, a late in the day, uh, surprise on, the <laughs> on driver lineup. Um, but, um, you know, firstly, we all love Felix here. And we all wish him the best at, at Shank. Really happy that he's got himself a deal there, a multi-year deal. You know, I think it just came down to we both kind of felt it was time for a, a change of scenery there. But great, great guy. Still uh, always going to be a friend. So um, uh, I'm glad I'm going to see him at the racetrack. Uh, still want to beat him, obviously. But <laughs> but yeah, no, when we had to, when we got down to it, 
this was a really interesting problem for me is like, and I want to develop how we do this more because it's, I mean, everyone out there playing F1 manager or whatever on their laptops, you know, <laughs> tries to play this game. I get, I'm, I'm playing it. <laughs> We're playing in real life over here, which is pretty interesting. And, uh, we did a little bit of both. Uh, we did like the money ball analytics, um, to some extent, I won't overstate the complexity of it, but, uh, we've got some pretty bright guys here on the data science side and, and, and kind of gave them a bit of a, a very loose brief of, you know, how would you do this? You got a few days, go figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, and then we, we kind of combine that with a little bit more, you know, character assessment, um, talking to people, you know, and so what came out of the analysis we saw, um, was, and this is always tricky, right? Cause how do you level for team performance? versus, um, you know, we looked at it in a bunch of different ways, but one thing was really clear is that David has been very, very quick relative to his teammates. Um, you know, when we're here as an IndyCar team, we want to win the championship and we want to win the Indy 500, you know, um, and roughly proportional interest in doing each, um, so a little bit of extra emphasis maybe on oval performance as well. Um, Lucas's data showed exceptionally well yeah. on, on ovals, seeing a pretty good level of improvement on the road and street courses as well. And two years of experience in IndyCar is a pretty good level. Um, it's hard to be a rookie in this series. Um, and that's a nice uh, level of experience. It's still very young. 22 now. Um, so <laughs> young gun. Um, so he made our short list just off the numbers um, and some sort of basic uh, things we were looking for. And then we, you know, when I first sat in the motor home and talked to him when his mom and dad are there as well. And TK, um, Tony Kanan was, w w was with us and he met him first and, TK say like he was wooed, I think pretty well, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was just really, it was a really great conversation. I just felt like this is a guy who's got his, he's bright. He's got his head screwed on. Right. He's doing a lot of things to invest in himself, which I liked. Um, he is great with the team. He's interested in being engaged. You know, it, he's moved down to be next to the shop. He just said he was going to do that. He wants to drive a pit stop practice car and the shop for pit stop practice. Like it, it helps a lot to have drivers that engaged. Yeah. Add to that, you know, what it's always, it's not perfect science when it comes to the numbers game, but um, we saw in him, you know, the other thing I think when you're looking for drivers is like, where are they in their career arc? Um, and I think there's a trend I have seen, and we've been, I think we might have talked about this before, but maybe not, um, which is a little bit, it's funny. I was telling this to somebody who runs a business and they thought it was more widely applicable than just race drivers. But I, I see young drivers like often have a bit of a career arc where raw speed peaks early yeah. and race craft peaks a bit later. When actually there's a little bit of a opposing graph of like racecraft and raw speed. And I think a lot of great drivers start out fast and crashy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the list is long. Kimi Raikkonen, Mark Weber, Sebastian Vettel, Max Verstappen. I mean, there was a time with Max Verstappen. I was like, this guy is so fast, but he can't, if he can't figure out how to manage your weekend, yeah, just it's all for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think David, as I said to him, I think the key to him now is, is fast forwarding the racecraft development, um, which I think he can do. And he's shown great racecraft. At, you know, the short oval performances have been a great yeah, example. Really good. Being able to drive through the field, and that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, but he had a few too many incidents last year. Now, qualifying poorly puts you back there and more exposed. So I think part of that comes with a little bit more quality pace. I think we can help with that. And I think he can help with that. So, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and then I think there's a really interesting thing that actually one of my spotters, we have a spotter right, that I really like. He's a, he's an old school guy, uh, Bob, Bob Jeffries. Uh, and he, he used to be Tony Stewart's spotter back in the day. No way. Yeah. And we were talking about like what makes a team where drivers get on well, hmm. um, you know, cause I think. Penske have had that over the years. It's been a real strength of theirs that their drivers get on well. And one of the things he's like, they have drivers that are all at different stages of their career. Hmm. You know, and it's like, combine, his idea was like, if you put up with three drivers that are all the same stage of their career, they're more likely to be kind of clashing on the same thing. So Penske often have one established older guard, you know, a mid mid career and a whippersnapper, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that was kind of an interesting take. I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I would say that we wouldn't say it drove our decision, but it was an interesting part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Rossi's got tons of experience. Yeah. I think he can play. He's a super bright, mature professional and dry sense of humor, funny guy, but, um, you know, he can play a role with the team. That helps everybody. We got Pato, who's like mid phase and tons of speed, and is got all the all the talent, and I think can put it together. And we're we're working with him to level everything up together, team and and, and approach to to put together you know what I think we can do, which is five hundreds and championships. And then David is on the earlier arc, but is also early, younger drivers a little more formable. Yeah. Um. And I think with TK and I kind of enjoying that situation where I feel like we can build a driver that's got the potential into what we think an awesome full package is. So for, for Pato, um, you know, fourth in the championship last season coming into, into this season, you know, I feel for, you know, for him, when I look at him as a, you know, outside looking in, he's very, you know, aggressive and it seems like you have to kind of rein him in just a little bit. Now, I'm not saying that being aggressive is a bad thing because you always, you know, I think it's, it's easier to have an aggressive driver because you can bring them, you can bring them in. But for Pato, when you take a look at the season coming up for him, I mean, what are your expectations for him coming in? Because he's got all the talent in the world, Gavin, and like he could win a championship. He can win an Indy 500. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love working with Pato. I think he's uh, he's brings all the enthusiasm, and everyone everyone sees that, and he's very uh, authentic. But I also think he's he's brighter uh, and uh, more thoughtful than uh, maybe people understand. I think you can have a real real good conversation with him about the nuts and bolts of. Um, what it takes to be a great race car driver. Um, and I thought we made a lot of progress last year. I thought it, you know, you could look and say, we didn't win a race, but we put up seven podiums. Um, it was his most consistent, yep. um, season. We, the only person who had more, more podium finishes was below. Um, you know, we missed out on top Chevy car by just a whisker, you know, really through a, a bit of a crapshoot finale um, of cautions that maybe we could have managed well better as a team. Um, but, you know, I think the key for him is to keep, and I, I love his attitude right now. So I'm excited for that. Um, I think he's got his head in, in a great place. Um, and we need him to push the team in a healthy, constructive way and be a, a motivating force um, for for us upping our game and we need him to, to really just keep on that path of making another step of like consistency, bringing the car home, taking what's on uh, available on a weekend. If that's a win, getting a win. If that's 11th place, get an 11th place, you know? Um, but don't try and overdo it when it's not there. Um, or underdo it when it is there, you know, it's just finding that balance of risk taking which is it is that's just racecraft and it's it's an interesting 
it's, it's Part like of you, yeah it's just like you had just mentioned right it's that uh cross yeah. and the axis and then also yeah. i mean it's like it's like scott dixon at the same time right if you look at if you look at dixie like i mean yeah. that guy takes whatever is available on the day and yes that's how he's always in championship contention that's why he's always so successful as well yeah um, for pato i mean detroit sticks out for me for pato last season and same with the 500 but you know, I, I see for, for him, like, he is an exceptionally talented driver. And, uh, yeah, I think he can do some huge things in the sport as well. Um, I was speaking with uh, Mark Miles uh, a few months ago, and I was asking him about the docuseries. So you had the 100 Days uh, to Indy that was on CW, was done through Vice, uh, last year and then coming into this year they were i know indycar was trying to work on something uh i'd heard that the producers from 100 days to indy were walking around uh the what was the media day during the indycar media availability a couple weeks ago when you look at these docuseries i mean we still in canada like we can't watch 100 days to indy like i i've only seen two episodes of the thing and like i couldn't tell you like what what happened in the entire season or if it was any good when you look at how important these things are, I mean, you know, there is on Netflix, like they just had a docu series on like Breakpoint, the tennis one. You've also got uh, quarterbacks for the NFL. You've also got PGA has one, F1, obviously. Uh, the list goes on. But like, how, you know, how important is it for, for IndyCar to kind of get on that page and try and get something yeah. out for this year? It is critical. Yeah, You can't be in this space without it. Yeah. And I, my personal opinion is that as a Canadian, I'm a little biased. I thought it was a real shame that that wasn't uh, available for the Canadian audience. I thought it was a big miss. I think I also think globally, sorry to interrupt you, Gavin, sorry to interrupt you, but I think also globally, globally like there's globally. like, there's folks in like yeah. the Netherlands, the UK, like all over where there's huge IndyCar fan yeah. bases and they couldn't even view it. I'm not saying that we need to be racing all over the world in IndyCar, that's probably not something we need to be doing. But um, I do think there's a great global demand for the sport, and that oh, yeah. we should we should make that make it available because you know the TV package they've had with um, in in the UK um, on Sky, I think, yes, yeah, yeah, Sky F1, F1 yep. Sky Sports F1 has been great for the sport and yeah i thought they did a great job with that docuseries i'd like it to be and i think it can be it actually needed to be more um it was a little bit too much just getting to know you on the on the drivers and i i think that it needs to be a little bit more drama which is there oh it's yeah the ad. i think they could cover the Indy 500 qualifying better. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I thought the people that did it did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. I thought it was super captivating. Um, would love to see better, wider distribution of that content. And I think as a team, we are so open to it. Like I said to the team when that came out last year, and it'll be the same again this year, is like, I'm going to open our doors. We're going to show them everything. Because I'm pretty sure that's going to put us in a good light. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm not afraid of what we got here. And I think it's great content. I want people to see what we're doing. I want people to see the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, it was, uh, yeah. And I, you know, I think in a second year of it, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We, we are chomping at the bit here, trying to, the, the passion people have for trying to beat Penske and Ganassi and keep beating everybody else is immense. Uh, <laughs> there's a bit of rivalry there. There's a bit of emotion, but, um, you know, but there's also just a lot of passion, which is, mm -hmm. and just, it's fun. We were so close. We had the 8,500 last year to lead 80 some odd laps be what I thought was two dominant cars and really put ourselves in the catbird seat and have it all come on undone with, you know, just a few laps to go was one of the more 
heartbreaking from a from a uh, results point of view things to happen to me in my career. Now, um, in the grand scheme of things, nobody got hurt, and you know, in a sport, this sport, you can't take that for granted. So, we all got to go home, and we get to go race another day, and we love what we do. So, as heartbreaking as it is, it's it's not that bad. Uh, but they need to, you know, that's stuff that I think a series can capture better than, 100%. and really just in a format that the world needs to, to oh. enjoy sport now, right? I mean, if you, like, even, like, if you covered, really, really covered, like, Graham's uh, Indy 500 experience from last year, like, yeah, his that's own teammate. Like, like, oh, my gosh. Was, we're in tears. And, like, <laughs> Man. I mean. Any 500 qualifying with bumping is, I think Saturday qualifying at the 500 is one of the coolest things in yeah. sport. Oh, man, I just don't think people understand just like how much like the car is just even on the limit uh, for the driver. <laughs> it yeah. Those four laps, man. Like it, <laughs> you're flying by the seat of your ass and. Yeah. And like you're, you're making totally it trimmed like, out. I don't really want to run again because I don't want to crash. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, not do that. That's just. <laughs> we'll take what we've got or you, we're going to run again and that's that it's, it's just intense emotions that I don't think you get in uh, many other forms of motorsport um, and that ability like that, that risk that you might not make the show yeah you know is the first time I did Indy 500 qualifying with bumping I mean it was nuts <laughs> I can only imagine dude last year was great because we were quick but you know like <laughs> Uh, I've also been on the other side where I got one of my team cars hitting the wall and last chance qualifying and somehow making a show. So yeah. I think when you live the runs where you, the front row runs and pole runs and you live the not making the show side of it, I mean, wow, it's intense. It's cool. Um, I know I don't have much more time with you, but I wanted to ask you about, you know, Jill DeFerrin. You guys had a close working relationship and, you know, obviously, you know, tragically, we, we've lost, we've lost Jill, but like, I mean, just for yourself, what, what did you learn like from, from him? Because, oh man, he had so much, so much knowledge, so much enthusiasm, so much passion for, for the sport and life in general. I mean, yeah, for, for, for you, like what, uh, what, what did, what did you learn most from Jill? Yeah. You know, I think first off, there are people at this team that have had a long, much longer relationship with Jill than I have. He was, very, very involved in the early days of this, this project. And a lot of people here were very close. So that was a, and it's such, to be so shocking and unexpected, um, is still difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, but I think his family are, I love their, their reaction and how they, they really want to celebrate Jill and, and how wonderful he's been. And, you know, for me personally, I went to the F1 race in Las Vegas, uh, this year, which is actually the first time I've been to an F1 race with since joining McLaren. And I spent pretty much the entire time there with Jill. He was, we just hit, we've hit it off and we hit it off in a very easy way with our both F1 IndyCar combined background. I think we saw the world of motor racing so similarly, but I think so many people have remarked, you know, since Jill's passing that Jill has a way of kind of making everybody feel like, um, they're, you know, that a big part of his life and important, like he's your best friend. And, and I, I just was really grateful for how, and maybe that's, that's the answer to your question in a way, um, is just how genuinely, interested in engaging and, uh, and fun, uh, of a guy he is super bright. Uh, Tony Kanaan and him were very, very close. And I know that's, that's been, is, is still really difficult for TK. And, you know, I just feel like I left Las Vegas and I came back and I told people like, man, I like, I think one of the coolest things about this trip, was like, I feel like I made a really good friend in, in, in Jill. And, uh, yeah, to have that happen so soon after is, it's just been such a, 
it just feels like uh, robbed of a what was a special, I think, the start of a special friendship. But, you know, I think so many people feel that Joe was a special person in their life. So yeah, I don't want to overstate my small yeah. bit of the picture. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it. Very well said. Uh, you know, Gavin, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to do this. Really do appreciate it. Um, very much looking forward to, to having you back on. Uh, in yeah, it's going to be fun. Bigger, bigger capacity as this season sort of uh, <laughs> winds up and gets going. But yeah, th thanks again. That's team principal Gavin Ward from Arrow McLaren IndyCar team. Gavin, thanks again, man. Thanks, Tim.